read this morning, and then uh, Brother Wickcock's going to come up. But in Jeremiah 29, 13, the Bible said, And ye shall seek me and find me when ye shall search for me with all your heart. Psalm 37, 4 says, Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. I hope this evening, as I asked for this morning, that the desires of your heart is to allow God to work in and through you that you might glorify him in all that which you do. Brother Woodcock's been a friend for years. Come on up here and have at it. We appreciate you, brother. Well, thank you for being here this evening. want. For I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Notwithstanding ye have well done that ye did communicate with my affliction. Now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. For even in Thessalonica ye sent once and again unto my necessity, not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. But I have all and abound. I am full having received of Epaphrodites the things which were sent from you, an odor of sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. Let's stop there and pray together tonight. Father, thank you for our time. I pray that you would uh, work. Lord, I pray again that you would be the director of all this. Lord, that be your words. That we'd recognize that no man deceives, uh, receives glory, deserves glory. And Father, the best that we could ever be tonight would be to be faithful to you, faithful to your word, faithful both in the, in the declaring of it and in the hearing of it, and faithful in the applying of the truth of your word to our life. When we would fall short in faithfulness, Lord, we would have fallen short. But there really is no more that we can do. We can't do anything tonight but be faithful to hear you, uh, faithful to, uh, to carefully understand what you say and carefully, careful to live it as we go about our days. Help us, Lord, to, uh, to just follow you through the word of God tonight, that you would receive honor and glory, and, Father, that we would live an abundant life that Christ purchased, purchased for us on Calvary. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for standing this evening, and please be seated. <laughs> well, there we go. Praise the Lord. Technology is tough, especially that battery technology. That's a tough one right there. <clears throat> Can I? <laughs> okay, focus. Before we really get into this text tonight, I want to talk to you a little bit about what we're what we're here for. 
And I want to talk to you about the subject of revival. And I know, though I don't know the details, I know that your pastor has been talking to you about revival. And I have said some of these things to you in the couple of years gone by. But it is important that we remember what a revival really is. Revival is probably one of the, the worst year used words in the Christian vocabulary. And we define it by something at best that could be a product, not a source or what it actually is. So uh, some people think of revival as, and I know you've heard this uh, recently, but as uh, like, you know, just getting super excited about things. That's called Christmas. Okay, that's, that's what that is. We, we have great anticipation. We get super excited. You know why that's really dangerous when it comes to revival? Because when you get super excited about things, especially things that aren't substantive, the letdown is worse than where you started. So really we could be moving backwards spiritually as a church and as individuals if we don't understand this issue of revival. Because we'd be like, wow, we're going to get revival. And I hope Brother Woodcock had extra storage space or a luggage space so he brought it with him. And then Brother Woodcock leaves and it's a letdown to you, not because I leave, just because the thing's excitement can't be sustained generally in routine things. And we go like, oh, that wasn't what I really hoped it would be. That's not revival. That's why it's not what you hoped it would be. So revival is something uh, far better than that. And I, I may have told you this before, but I want to I talk to you for a minute. You don't have to go there about the book of Nehemiah. Because in the book of Nehemiah, you'll know that Nehemiah went back from captivity to Jerusalem with a with a small group of people. He was the third, I guess, uh, maybe the fourth. I think both of the prophets took some people back with them, but uh, a return of people from the Babylonian captivity into the promised land. And he went back there with the purpose, the intention, really the commission to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. When they captured a city, you know that they would lay siege on them, okay? So they would surround them and try to cut off water and food and threaten them and uh, scare them and really wear them down. But when they would finally break through that siege, when there would be a weakness and the siege would end and the attack would start, they would have to get through those walls and sometimes they might climb over, but they always ended up destroying those walls. They always ended up knocking them down and putting them in piles of rubble, and there was reason for that. And that reason was a city with no walls was not protected, and for that city to now rise up again and become a threat or in rebellion against its new uh, dominator, its new uh, captor, would be impossible until the walls were rebuilt in that city. And this city had been lying in waste for a long time, and it was suffering from it. This is after the return to rebuild the temple. In fact, the temple that was rebuilt, the second temple was built by the time that Nehemiah goes back and, uh, and uh, yet the people are still in peril. Did you catch that? You see, some of us might think just sort of mystically maybe that, that if the temple was there, everything would be okay, right? We just kind of have this idea and there's a truth in it to a degree, but we just thought if the temple was there, we don't have to worry about anything else. We got the temple. God will be pleased with us. We'll know that because he'll pour out wonderful things upon us and the people that are coming through and stealing our stuff won't come anymore and it'll just, everything will be okay. But everything wasn't okay. In fact, there were still the same, the same bands of men. They're called thugs, uh, not in the Bible, by the Woodcock version, right? Uh, they're the, uh, the armies of Samaria, and the army of Samaria was made up of a bunch of thugs, okay? They were people that were of the remnants of all sorts of different things in the northern part of the divided kingdom, and, and they were just there having their way with the people of Jerusalem and surrounding areas because they had no protections whatsoever. So Nehemiah goes back to build the wall. And he's given resources by the king. He's got direction and plans. And he goes out and he surveys the work. He finds the work to be immense and overwhelming. That, the, that all of the things that had once been the rocks of the wall were broken down. They were lying in piles of rubble. The wood associated with them had been burned and it was of no value. The gates had all been made into campfires or something. And, and all of that was just junk. And so he brought the people together and he said, let's get to work. 
And he challenged them with what God had done and reminded them of what God had provided. And, and he, uh, uh, he uh, told them about the work and he told them about the goodness of God. And, and they, got to, they, they began to get excited about it. They began to get committed to it. And so it says they strengthened their hands. That's what it says in the book of Nehemiah. They strengthened their hands for this good work. And they began to build. Well, as soon as they began to build... The armies of Samaria, Sanballat and Tobiah and the other thugs that made them up, they didn't want that. And they rode down there to try to intimidate them into quitting. And there's always a pressure when you start to put things where they belong to go back to the broken condition that you were in before in your life. And that's what was happening to them, these uh, people. And so they began to mock them, and they, they say a bunch of things. I'm not going to uh, try to preach that. Well, maybe I will, but we'll change our message if we do it. Um, but uh, they say this, like, what will these feeble Jews? So just imagine you're sitting there working on this immense task, right? And up uh, come these thugs who have been mm, taking advantage of you greatly. They're kind of bullies. That's what they are. And they say this, well, what do these feeble Jews? You probably think... I think they like us, right? That's, you know, what they're doing is trying to say, you, you don't have, you, you people are not, you, you're nothing. You people are garbage. You people will never finish anything. You've never done anything. You lost this once. You won't get it back. You're not enough to get this done. They're just trying to intimidate them. Will they, uh, will they, uh, will they, will they uh, call upon their God? Will their God help them? They're mocking God. They're ultimately saying, look, you're not enough, and your God is not enough. But it's the last phrase that I just want you to look at for a moment. Because they say, will they revive these stones out of the heaps of rubble? Everybody got that one? So the word revive means what you think it really means, just in technical meaning. And that is to bring life back to something. Okay? So to take something that was living and is no longer living, and to restore it to living. That's what the word revive means. And so they ask a question that ought to puzzle you. It's probably puzzled archaeologists and uh, whoever else messed with rocks all of since then. How, do you make, how did stones ever live, and how do you bring them back to life? I mean, I know CPR, I don't know SPR, right? I don't, stone, pulmon, I don't know how that works. How do you bring stones back to life? Now, we did talk about this next part last year, I think. And we talked about what a living stone is in Scripture. And a living stone, I'll remind you, is one that is uh, used in construction. So it's not just a stone in the field, but it's used in construction. That means that it's been shaped and, and put uh, together or put in a way for a purpose. It's been used in construction and it is currently filling its function. So here's what Sam Ballot and Tobiah and the other thugs said. How are you going to put these stones back where they belong? How are you going to make them fill their original function? This was something great one day, but it'll never be again. Will you revive these stones out of the heaps of rubble? This, the, you've lost it. It'll never be anything. It won't matter at all. And it didn't deter the builders. But in it we find what revival really is. Because you see, a stone was a living stone when it was uh, used in construction and currently filling its function. And that means that it had a particular place in a consolidated structure. Isn't that right? Like if you have a brick house, most of your bricks are probably in your neighborhood. Right? And maybe they're even together. Yeah, they work together. They each have their place and they have different functions. And that always happens in any kind of construction. And so literally the idea of reviving them is putting them back into the place, please hear me, that they were once at and that they were intended to be at. That they were molded, shaped, and intended to be in by the builder. When the builder built the walls, he, those stones were crafted, each one for a particular spot, and to bring them back to life would be to restore them to their intended normal functions. Everybody got this? And that, the church, is revival. There is no normal function in the Word of God for members of a body who are part-time members of a body. How many of you are glad of that? I mean, if we just took the analogy of the body in Scripture and imagined a part-time heart. 
Anybody want one of those? Part-time lungs. I got a great one. This would be fun. Part-time eyes. Wouldn't that be great? (laughs) And your eyes fail. It's really a bummer you're on one of those roads like that for a moment. So understand that what we're what we're seeking after is lives and lives together that would that would be what God calls normal. God's intended function for each of us in this church. What he's equipped us for, what he's called us to, what he's placed us here for. And that never goes away. That there's always a normal function for every member of a church. One of the problems is we don't always like our function, do we? Sometimes we want somebody else's function. You can see how that would be problematic if your entire house was made out of front doors. It wouldn't work out very well. And imagine what would happen if the whole church was uh, filled with people who were only called to sit in the pews. In fact, (laughs) there is no calling to sit in the pews. Only. Every part of the body has a function. Yours does too. And every part of the body of Christ in this place has a function. And revival is when we get back to a right relationship or a normal relationship on God's terms. And that relationship uh, produces in us the performance of our normal function. So if all we do is get excited about a relationship, but something doesn't change in our function within the body, have we experienced revival? No. And that will fade very quickly, won't it? Because one of the things you need to continue growing in Christ, is a function. Spiritual service is part of producing spiritual growth. And the people who don't serve in their church are not growing the way they should grow. Does everybody understand this? We're looking for normal on God's terms, aren't we? Normal function, normal relationship on God's terms. Now, we just read Philippians chapter 4, or part of it, and here tonight I want to talk to you about something called contentment. Now, hear me, and I'll define it for you, and we'll jump into this text for a few minutes. There is no normal Christian living in discontentment. It does not exist. A discontented Christian is something that God would never contemplate as being a right and normal condition or state. It's just not there. And how could it be so? How could it be that the people of the Most High God, who were purchased by the blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ, the Most High God manifest in the the flesh, who became sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. I mean, I'm just kind of wondering how it is that you and I can ever get discontented. We do, but it doesn't make any real sense, does it? Discontentment is uh, something that uh, really doesn't belong in the life of a believer. Now, uh, I'm not telling you tonight that, that if you're struggling with some things, that that means that you're a, a really bad person. I'm telling you that we're called to live lives of contentment in Jesus Christ. So what is contentment? Well, uh, we probably all know, but let me just read you something from a book. That way I'll be sounding really smart tonight. But it says this. Concerning uh, this description, Christian contentment is that sweet, inward, quiet, gracious frame of spirit. Now, here, that's talking about our outlook, our perspective, that we have a sweet spirit, and that we have a, that it's an inward thing, it's not all put on, and that it's quiet, meaning that it's willing to set before God and wait in quietness, and that it's gracious, uh, the gracious reign of spirit. But here we go with the rest of it, the function, freely submitting to and taking complacency in God's wise and fatherly disposal in every condition. Now, I know this is written in language that we don't use very much today because complacency in this era of English didn't mean like, I don't care. It meant that I'm fully and completely confident and satisfied in what God does in my life. 
this complacency in what God does in the wise and fatherly disposal of every condition means this, that when God begins to work and he, and he does things in my life or directs me to things in my life, that instead of saying, I don't want that, a one who is content says, I want that because of who he is. I'm, I'm at peace with that. I'm joyfully submitting to whatever God wants in my life because that's the complacency of spirit the Bible, that this definition talks about. See, contentment with any master would mean that we would readily obey that master, wouldn't it? Because we're so contented with the master that what he says doesn't cause us to debate whether we want to fulfill his commands or not. And that's true of, of Christian contentment. That sweet, inward, quiet, gracious frame of spirit, freely submitting to and taking complacency in God's wise and fatherly disposal of every condition. Can I tell you this? When God directs it, when God writes it in the word of God, uh, when God leads into it through the word of God by his spirit, a content Christian, a normal Christian says, that's exactly what I'm going to do and that's exactly what I want. And that's contentment. I'm satisfied. And whatever God decides I need is what I'm com complacent with. And when I would not have what seems like enough, but I would know it's what God provided, that I would be content with that. Contentment. And this text that we read is Paul describing his journey to contentment, how he became contented in all things. I want you to learn about it. Look in verse 10. The first thing I just want to give you is some truth about contentment that we find here. Here's the big one. The gratitude toward God and contentment with God and his provision are inseparable in your life. If you don't have gratitude toward God for what he has done and given, you will never be contented with what he's done and given. If God gives you uh, provision, direction, uh, uh, listen, uh, everlasting life, and, and you don't have gratitude what towards God, toward what God does, you're always going to be looking for that which would produce gratitude in you. A person that cannot be thankful to God for whatever God does because he's God in our life will never be one who's contented with God. They'll never be able to live a normal, revived life. They'll always be striving because they'll, uh, the, the, for something more. They'll never be a sweet, inward, uh, quiet, gracious frame of spirit in their life. It says in these verses, in verse 10, that, that uh, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at the last your care of me had flourished again, wherein you were also careful, but you lacked opportunity. Paul is now in the midst of his missionary journeys. He's out on this church planning work, and, and really Paul is out there most of the time, it seems, without any real financial support. The funny thing about that is, is you never hear Paul talk about that as if, why don't you people get on board? Don't you love it when you get beat up over giving money? Oops, was I supposed to say that in the revival, preacher? I don't know. No, see, the truth of the matter is, is that Paul never did that. And, and we know that the Philippians had a desire to try to meet Paul's needs. Here's how much we know that. If you look in verse 15, it says, uh, Now you Philippians know also that at the beginning of the gospel, that, in the be uh, that when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. And so as Paul writes this, at the beginning of his journeys or his missionary ministry, the, the church in Philippi, uh, that they had been uh, sending to him some kind of financial support to help him along the way. That's appropriate. It's not unbiblical. Obviously, it's biblical. And it's not that missionary being selfish. Someone needs to pay the bill to get the work done. Isn't that right? And yet he says this, you did that, but back in verse 10 he says, now I rejoice, or but I rejoice in the Lord greatly, that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, uh, wherein ye were also careful, but ye lacked opportunity. And so what happened is, verse 15 and 16, when he started, they were supporting him financially. He'd have been on their wall if they had one. But something happened in their church. Something happened in their lives where they could no longer send to him financial support. Here's what's interesting about it and part of the normal is that they wanted to. 
It says there in verse 10 that, that uh, you, it's flourished again right after that, wherein you were also careful. That means that they cared to, they desired to, they had a want to send to Paul. They were saying every month, can't we just do something to help this along the way? They just were not able to. There was never a quitting on their part. There was never a dropping of their interest in the, in the uh, work, uh, the missionary enterprise that Paul had undertaken. It just was that they didn't uh, have the opportunity. But now something had changed according to verse 10 because now it says that it has flourished again. That it had been going and then it couldn't go on and now it had flourished again and they'd begun again uh, to, to contribute or to communicate to Paul's needs. And Paul was grateful for that. He said, I rejoice in this. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein ye were also careful, uh, <clears throat> but lacked, ye lacked opportunity. And Paul looks at what they do for him as a gift, not an entitlement. And he looks at it as a gift from God, not simply a gift from a group of people who mean well. And he looked at it rightly. And because of that, what we find in Paul is gratitude toward God. I rejoice, he says, verse 10, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly. Because whatever God did that enabled you to begin again to be a part of this work, I recognize that God did that, and I rejoice in the Lord. Gratitude and contentment are inseparable and Paul's journey, really, to, to gratitude or to contentment that we find here begins with gratitude, thanksgiving, acknowledging the goodness of God in all of those things. Now, we understand that contentment is an inward condition, but you listen to me tonight, church. Contentment is also an inward spiritual condition that we must learn. This isn't something that just happens. In fact, verse 11 says that, if you look at it, not that I speak in respect of want. So he says this, I'm not saying these to you things to you because I need your money. I'm not saying because I don't have what I need and I just need it and I don't want to work. No, no, whenever Paul didn't have enough, we know this, that he went out and made tents, the Bible says. He was a tent maker, that was his trade. He would work with his hands to provide his need. He said, not that I speak in respect of want. Listen to this, for I have learned, you catch that? For I have learned... Um, verse 11, in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. He learned contentment, and he, he learned through this process with God that, that, uh, that he can just be thankful for whatever God gives through whatever means, and he doesn't say that because, whoo, I'm going to make it now, I know I'm going to eat. He says this, no, I've learned this, that whatever God gives is enough, that whatever God does is enough, and if I have a lot, that's enough. And if I have nothing or a little, it's enough. I've learned in whatsoever state I'm in, therewith to be content. Why? Well, it began with that gratitude, didn't it? That he was thankful for whatever God did. And in this process, he learned. There's a lesson he learned. This is the outcome of the lesson. It's not the lesson. He said, I've learned in whatsoever state I am in therewith to be content. That was the outcome of the lesson. That everything I've learned through this process, we'll see that lesson in a moment, uh, but everything has brought me to this point that I'm now able to be content with whatever God does in my life. You want to figure out yet? why this is an essential norm in a Christian's life. Because how do you keep going when you're dissatisfied with what God allows or brings into your life? If you're discontented with God's sovereign actions, you'll never be contented in God if you're dissatisfied with Him. If you look at Him and complain about God's sovereign actions, it'll never be enough. We were sitting in Rapid City, South Dakota one time. My, my wife and I, we were on the road in evangelism. And we had a few days of vacation. We were headed from, I don't know, Minnesota to somewhere. And we decided on the way we'd go by the Black Hills. We'd never been there. We wanted to see it, you know. And um, so we parked at an Air Force base in our RV, on, at an RV park there on the Air Force base. We'd been, out in the, we'd been out there at Mount Rushmore the day before, and we were getting ready to go, I want to say, down to the Badlands that are east of there. And 
and enjoy that in the morning. Sitting in the back of the trailer in my recliner, my phone rings. And it's, you know, breakfast time or so. And when I, when I answered the phone, there was just silence. And I, of course, recognized the number as my oldest daughter. And, and I could hear her sobbing on the phone. And um, she said to me, when she finally composed herself, Dad, the baby's dead. She was late into a pregnancy and she'd been to the doctor the week before. She went every week because the first child had had some weaknesses they were concerned, but this baby was super healthy. Everything was perfect. Strong heartbeat, no, no abnormal tests at all. And now they're just moving into that place where you're just headed real fast towards holding a new, a new child in your arms. And she went to the doctor and they found no heartbeat. She said, it's, it's just gone. It's dead. Can I tell you that I couldn't find a reason why? I couldn't find an explanation for that. There wasn't one, except one. Not that God took that child, I don't believe that for a second. But that God allowed that into my life and her life and our life. And honestly, the next few days became a blur to us. We made a crazy trip from, uh, from uh, the Black Hills there in Rapid City down to just outside of Wichita, Kansas. We left as quick as we could get packed up and go and dragging our trailer through the middle of the night and, and uh, finally got there in the wee hours of the morning, rushed to the hospital and, the, and got to uh, just uh, for a moment hold uh, the now delivered, stillborn baby. Looked at her, she was the spitting image of her older sister when she was born. She was a beautiful, perfectly formed little baby girl. We went home and got some rest, and that afternoon they called us and said they're going to send us home from the hospital. And we went up there, and we walk in, and my daughter goes into the room to change into her clothes out of her robe, and she comes out of that room. She comes out of that little restroom where she changed, and she was weeping, and she fell into my arms just sobbing. I couldn't figure it out. She finally said, Dad, this is so out of place. I'm putting my clothes on, and they were, of course, clothes that fit her pregnant. And I'm going home with the clothes not fitting right, but no baby. And a few days later, we stood at a service with a casket that would sit on top of this pulpit. As they committed her remains to the grave. I can tell you that I worried every day. I prayed every day. I worried. I constantly called. I talked to my daughter. I talked to my son-in-law because I had this concern that my daughter would become bitter towards God. That she would no longer be content with what God allows into our life. And recognize the provision and wonder Say, preacher, how can you be content with that? You can't, but you can be content with God. And know that this sovereign God knows what he's doing. And that though you and I don't understand it or wouldn't have chosen it that way, God knows what he's doing. And God is unchanged by any of this. I was afraid that she'd begin to think God might not be faithful, might not be good and that would hurt her worse. That would cost her more than the loss of this sweet child. But uh, I'm just telling you this, that as the years unfolded, a couple of years maybe later, I'm sitting there. There's a ladies' meeting in the church that she's a member of. And uh, no, I wasn't at the ladies' meeting. But I was sitting up in the sound booth with a friend of mine as my wife, uh, my wife, my daughter stood up uh, to address. She spoke at that meeting. 
They'd had a number of very uh, out of place things go on in their early years of ministry there. And she stood up there, though, and she talked about this. And she was weeping as she said, I didn't know how to do, deal with this. I, I couldn't do And to be honest with you, I was angry at God for a while, but I've learned. I learned to be content that God is enough. I still go to the grave when we go to town. But God's still enough. And now my daughter and her daughters will go up there, and instead of being morose and angry at God, they'll thank God and rejoice in the life they have together. Not that I speak in respect of want, but I have learned in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be condemned. The normal condition for a Christian is contentment with the fatherly disposal of God. It's the inward condition. And it must be learned. Now I believe, church, that we can learn things one of two ways. We can learn them because the events come upon us and force us to learn them. Or we can learn them because they're given to us as truth in the word of God. We can either learn by appropriating truth so that we're prepared when we go into difficult things or we'll learn them in the midst of difficult things, usually not without some kind of difficulty or injury because of it. So, preacher, what did Paul learn? Well, verse 12, 12 talks more about this lesson. When he says this, I've, I've learned, I know how to be abased and how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. This is a pretty complete lesson that he learned where he could go into anything he said, and he's learned this. He's just learned that, that I know how to both uh, be abased and to abound. Now, can I tell you that this is not like a Swiss Army knife learning, all right? That, you know, the one, the tool for everything. I went to Europe when I was in high school. I bought the biggest Swiss Army knife they had in the store. Back then, you could take stuff on an airplane. <clears throat> I mean, it had a magnifying glass, tweezers, uh, scissors, uh, corkscrew, don't know what for. I never took a cork out of anything in my life. But uh, a bottle opener, it had a can opener. I, I mean, I really couldn't sit here and tell you all those things. Had a toothpick, you know, you pull it out of the side, you pick your teeth, put it back in there. Don't worry about the mold, it scrapes off when you pull it out again, it's all good, right? <laughs> That's not what this is. This is not the Swiss Army knife of life. This is a lesson about, our, about who we are and about understanding the sufficiency of, of Christ and being contented uh, with no matter what he gives. This abasing and abounding is not him making a list of going, yeah, check, did that one, I got that one under control. No, this abasing and abounding is him saying no matter what God gives, no matter what God brings and allows, whether it's a lot or a little, whether it's more than I need or nothing, I'm completely satisfied, I'm content in it because it's from the hand of my God. Amen. Contentment. So tell me, preacher, I see the results, but what is the lesson? I mean, he says again in verse 12, we just talked about that he's been instructed. I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry. What is the instruction? What is the lesson that you and I must learn that Paul learned before we'll ever truly be content? I think that lesson is contained in verse 13. I'd like you to look at it. Because here's what he learned, that I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Now let me tell you what that is not. That is not you being super empowered. That is God being all powerful. That is not you getting a little juice. You, you see those oxygen cans you can carry now, right? If you go hiking, that might be an indictment on us as Americans, right? Going hiking, take oxygen along. You can buy those little portable oxygen cans, you know, they got a little mouthpiece on them. <laughs> I'm thinking about putting one under the pulpit someday in case I get carried away. <laughs> Might need a little shot of juice. That's not what this is. This is the power of God. This is the, the, the fullness of God. This is all that God is that he's learned 
I can do all things through Christ. It's not that I can do all things. These are not superhero stunts. Can I tell you this? There are probably some things Paul couldn't do. Paul couldn't walk on water unless Jesus made him walk on water. Right? Never happened. We don't have a record of it. I think we would if it did. I want you to understand that this is not something to, to get you when you're facing insurmountable odds because you've made stupid mistakes. Sorry, but bankruptcy because you're stupid is just bankruptcy because you've done, made unwise decisions. Let me say it that way. I'm not picking on it. We all make bad decisions in our life, don't we? If you're uh, fortunate enough to have less hair than you used to and some of it is white, you've made a whole bucket load of bad decisions and good decisions in your life. This isn't Paul saying, well, no matter what comes along, even if it's just, uh, you know, I can just charge through it. I don't have to follow God. There's no need for any of that. It's just that I can do all things because I'm now a spiritual superman. That's not what it says. Let me tell you what it really says. You ready? You need to get this. The lesson that Paul learned was this lesson, that the all-sufficient Christ is sufficient for all things. Please get this. We all would declare Christ to be all sufficient. But contentment requires that we appropriate this truth that the all sufficient Christ is not simply a theory. It's not simply an idea about him, but that he himself, he plus nothing is sufficient for all things in your life. When you get the middle of the night call, when you when you don't see the way forward, when you're, you're, you're begging for a loved one to be redeemed and they enter into eternity without any idea that they've ever reserved, received Christ. You know, we try, to, we try to find a way to comfort ourselves in saying, although no one knew they were probably saved because we had told them about Jesus, maybe, but I'm just here to tell you that if that's where you're getting your comfort, that's pretty weak comfort. What someone might have done. But can I tell you where you find contentment? When you appropriate and live this truth that the all-sufficient Christ is sufficient for all things. That no matter what comes along, no matter what comes from him, no matter what he allows into your life, he himself is sufficient. That's how you learn to be both abased and to abound. Because it's not about how to manage money and not manage money. It's not about eating high on the hog or not eating high on the hog. It's this, that no matter what the conditions are in my life, no matter what the circumstances are in my life, I have this one unalterable truth that Jesus Christ is all sufficient and he is sufficient for all things. And that whether I have a lot or a little, whether I'm sick or whether I'm healthy, whether I'm, uh, whether I'm short or whether I'm tall, I mean, I don't know on whether I, whether I have a car or my car is broken down. Yeah, I know lots of those circumstances can be difficult and some of them are not. I'm just telling you easy or difficult, uh, small or little, uh, whatever it might be, light or heavy, that the truth that makes us content, wherein we learn the lessons of contentment, if you'll appropriate it into your life, that no matter what you encounter tonight, no matter what you encounter, counter tomorrow, no matter what's going on in your life, I'm telling you this, hard, not hard, whatever, that in the midst of all of this, that the all-sufficient Christ is sufficient for all things. He's enough when you have a lot. He's enough when you have nothing. He's enough when you're in poor health. He's enough when you're in good health. He's enough when you're at home. He's enough when you're struggling to get back there. The all-sufficient Christ is sufficient for all things. And it's the lesson we must learn. The lesson we must learn. Say, preacher, how do I learn it? Your choice. You can either take Paul's testimony or you'll have to craft your own. You'll have to struggle with discontentment. You'll have to be abnormal in your relationship with God. You have to be unsatisfied by Jesus Christ. You have to be looking for him plus something until you get so tired of that and you come to the understanding that the all-sufficient Christ is sufficient in all things. You can either learn it from truth or you can learn it from life. But if you want to learn it, if you want to live it, it's a lesson that must be learned. Now, I, I want you to notice that Paul also commends the Philippians. 
And I do want to give you a little bit of instruction. Because while Christ is sufficient for all things, he often uses means in our life, doesn't he? How many of you believe that the Holy Spirit of God is the greatest teacher of the Word of God? That he will guide us into all truth. Come on, say amen. And in fact, he is God the Spirit. Isn't that right? But the Bible does say that whatever, whatsoever he learns from or hears from Christ, that he teaches us. Isn't that right? And we got the entire Bible really by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God, didn't we? So you don't really need a pastor. Right? I mean, I don't need him. I know as much as he does. I, I have the Holy Spirit, and he has the Holy Spirit of God. I, I, you know, I don't really need him nagging me about what he thinks God has said. I can, I can read, and the Holy Spirit of God can speak to me. And I'll give you my favorite one that I've been told in the last two years. This was the counsel that I got, that if I didn't have enough gas to go to church, that God didn't mind if I just skipped. The Bible doesn't say that. You know how you come to that conclusion? Discontentment. There's always, enough, there's always enough money and gas to do this or that, but not for church. Can I tell you what it is? Is that Christ just wasn't enough any longer. So they came to this startling revelation somehow that, that if, if church just didn't work into your budget, just throw it on the side. If it didn't work into your schedule, don't rearrange your schedule. Don't put Christ above all things. You just, you just uh, change your schedule, put Christ at the back, and Christ is perfectly satisfied with the leftovers of your life. Anybody believe that story? Why would he be satisfied with the leftovers of a life he purchased with his own blood? Not only does, uh, does he expect, I believe, the surrender of our life in full contentment, but he's, he is worthy of the surrender of our life in full contentment. That anything held back from him is really a sign that we're not content with him. Because if we're holding back our life to somehow preserve it from surrender to God, it just means that we don't trust Christ with our life. We're not contented in that. But even saying all of that, I don't really mean that you don't need a pastor. I'm telling you that God gives you a pastor to instruct you, to guide you, to help you, even to rebuke you and exhort you. We hate that part, don't we? But the Bible gives him that charge towards you in your life. And you, you need, and I need, someone in my life that will, with the word of God, with simple love for me because he loves God, be willing to say the hard things to me like, the road you're on is leading to destruction. I'll help you get off it if you'll allow me to. And oh, by the way, there's enough sin in your life that until you can get that straight, there are some things from which you're precluded from doing in the church. We want you to do them, but you've got to get your life right with God. Why? Because he's the great spiritual principle? No, because he knows what's best for you from the word of God. Amen. And God uses him in your life. And to have a spiritual leader, a pastor uh, uh, that, that is uh, just uh, humbly taking the word of God and feeding and pleading and rebuking and exhorting you and to be dissatisfied in that provision of God is to be discontented with God. It has very little to do with him. I'll describe your pastor for you. Imperfect. Does not know everything. Sometimes it's probably stubborn. Am I right about that? He's <laughs> a former Marine. You say, Preacher, aren't you supposed to be talking to us about how he gets up at 2 o'clock in the morning and prays until 8, reads the Bible till noon, goes and feeds the poor until 4, takes his family out and gives them spiritual exercises until 8 p.m., goes back into the church house and prays over the church house until midnight, goes home and goes to bed and sleeps until 2 and starts it all over again. And he's so in tune with the word of God that if you walk up to him and say, what does God say? He goes, <clears throat> thus saith the Lord God Almighty. 
Do you know it's possible you walk up to your pastor and ask him a question and he'll go like this? Uh, I don't know. Can I get back to you on that? But Paul expresses gratitude towards people that God uses in his life. He absolutely does. He, he tells them, listen, you, he, he commends them. Verse uh, uh, 14, notwithstanding, ye have well done that ye did communicate with my affliction. God used you in my life, and you have done well that you let God use you in my life. And I want to tell you this, that, that that's a part of contentment. That to say that you're contented with God, but to be dissatisfied with everything connected to God in your life is a lie. You're a liar. Because you cannot be contented with God and discontented with everything God has put into your life. Those things are incongruous, aren't they? They, 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 they don't balance. There's, no, there's nothing there. They don't, that's not an equal sign. Contentment with God means contentment with everything that he does in my life. And I've learned whether to abase and whether to abound. You say, preacher, my, my, my pastor, I'm not saying this of him, my pastor is not the sharpest knife in the drawer. Yeah, that's okay. You've learned how to be abased and about. Does he honestly handle the word of God? Does he love you? Does he pour into your life and is he patient when you, with you when you sneer at the things God's given him? And tell him, prove it. To be dissatisfied with what God has placed into your life is to be dissatisfied or discontented with God. And, and discontentment always starts with a lack of gratitude. Simple lesson. The all-sufficient Christ is sufficient for all things. That's the lesson that brings contentment. But the journey to that lesson began with gratitude. And then trusting God enough when he had nothing so that God plus nothing would equal all he needed. And understanding that God will use people in your life. And sometimes he has to use them to do hard things in your life. We had a family join our church. Wanted, I think, to be the pastor and the associate pastor. I'm not sure. We have a little policy that when someone comes and joins the church, that we have them, that there's lots of things they can do. They can be involved in certain ministries, but there are three areas that you don't uh, serve in until you know us and we know you better. And they are on-platform ministries, children's ministries, and leadership. If we don't know you, haven't trained you, haven't done a background check on you, you're not working with our kids, Okay. If we don't know where you stand spiritually and your temperament to a degree, and you understand this, we're not going to put you in leadership over other people spiritually. So we have that little policy. And part of getting to know folks is to recognize both good things and difficult things in their life. Isn't that right? And this is what we learned about these folks. Dear folks, we love them very much. I'm trying to give you an example. I'm not in any way putting them down, but they had a marriage that was a wreck. They didn't seem to like each other. They didn't get along. They were on two different pages. In fact, each would speak poorly of the other and sometimes in front of or towards other people. Nothing in there is a biblical marriage. At the end of six months, they came and said, well, preacher, I want to do that and he wants to do that. I want to lead a choir and he wants to lead a children's ministry or vice versa, I don't remember. Now they had to learn to be content with God because I said, I'm sorry, but until we sit down and begin to work through your marriage and begin to get some things in line, you can't serve. You can do the things you're doing, but you can't serve in these positions. You... You can't do it. I can't put you in children's ministry teaching children while you have your own children out of sorts because of the condition of your relationships. Let me tell you that they had to learn whether they were going to be contented with God because of what he put in their life in me as their pastor. No, they're not contented with me. That's not really my issue or concern. 
But clearly we were exercising what God needed us to exercise in their life so that they could truly honor and serve Him. And they either had to say, God's enough, and we're, we need to grow, or they had to say, we won't do it. It's hard sometimes when spiritual leadership has to help you correct yourself so that you can robustly serve God. And if that's when you get out of sorts with them, begin to grumble and complain, can I just tell you who you're really grumbling and complaining about? God. The all-sufficient Christ is not sufficient for you. Well, I just don't agree with the way that was handled. There might be room for a conversation on that. But murmuring and discontentment is not a way to handle it. Setting back and saying, well, I'm coming, but in my heart I'm not here, is not the way to handle it. Because the only way that you can be a revived church and a revived individual is to come to the point where this is true of your life. Whether it's hard or easy, a lot or a little, the all-sufficient Christ is sufficient for all things in my life. And that includes leadership and such that he brings into my life as they follow him. As they follow him. And what we really need if we want revival is a season of contentment. We need to make some decisions from the lessons Paul learned and begin to practice contentment in our life. And listen, uh, content, contentment is the condition that you need in your life, uh, and it'll come when you rightly frame things. What does that mean? It means to put events in your life in the right perspective. The perspective that this is the provision of God and therefore it's enough because he's enough. Not that this is the provision of God, but I want a lot more. I deserve better. All of those sorts of things. So I'm telling you that you'll never be full. The problem with this is discontentment is really like hunger. You, do you ever get up and go to the refrigerator and you're hungry and you open it up and it's chock full of food and you go like, ah, there's nothing in there that I want. Nothing will satisfy you. I mean, listen, there have been times in my life I've been so discontented in that way that I've turned down dark chocolate. Now, you can bet that doesn't happen frequently. That was a pretty low estate. But it happens in your life, doesn't it? You go to the restaurant, the, your favorite restaurant, because someone can see that you're struggling. They want to try to encourage you. You sit down there with your favorite menu and go, what do you want? And say, nothing there looks good to me. Life chock full of stuff. And none of it's enough. There's, there's just nothing. And so you'll never be full. So you'll always be ranging. Can I say it just a metaphoric way? You'll be going from refrigerator to refrigerator to walk away from every one of them empty. It's what Solomon learned, wasn't it? Solomon's issue was a contentment issue ultimately. And it begins with gratitude. When you find yourself empty, Discontent. Half in and half out. Your problem is discontentment with Christ. It is not normal. It is not a normal condition for a believer. And you're going to begin to solve this with gratitude. Thankfulness. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptation, knowing this, the trying of your faith worketh patience, and let patience have her perfect work. That I'm to be able to thank God when I'm in the midst of the most difficult things. The most difficult. Why? Because contentment begins with gratitude. And that if I can't thank God for things in my life, I will never be content. I'll go to another refrigerator. Can I say this tonight? You ought to right now, you ought to right now think about the top three things that just burn your ears. They just make you mad. You're not at all satisfied with them. And yet there's nothing wrong with them ultimately. And you ought to, you ought to in this room tonight get down on your knees and begin to give God thanks for those things that you are most discontented with in your life. Whether they be here or in your family or just in your personal spiritual life. Because contentment begins with gratitude. And if we're going to have a season of contentment, 
We're going to give thanks to God and we're going to express thanks to those God uses in our life because it will produce gratitude in our life. Do you know that in America today, the average preacher moves about every five years? That's just about enough time to figure out which of you he doesn't like. How could a preacher leave every five years having professed a call of God on one end and a call of God in the other, and not be here long enough to make a real difference. Can I tell you how? Discontentment. I will tell you this. You can like it or not, or believe it or not, but a discontented church, people, will produce a discontented preacher. Because they'll never be willing to abase or abound. They'll always be, well, no, I can't because of me. No, I won't because of my thing. And they'll never just say, God plus nothing is enough. I'm going to follow and be thankful for what he put in my life. And so the work just gets static. It gets routine. And I don't know anybody, including you, that thinks the church ought to just be static and routine. I think you'd like to see people coming into this place and being born again and people serving in this place and a junior church or something over there. And uh, I don't know, you can name it. I don't know what your plans and dreams are. I'm just telling you that none of them are his, they're ours. And when you and I are so discontented in our life that we're constantly grabbing for more, we don't have time to serve God here. A discontented church shouldn't but will produce a discontented preacher. Well, preacher, I'm going to test that one, see how long he can last. You'd be a fool. What you ought to do is decide tonight that an all-sufficient Christ is sufficient in all things. And let no temporal thing of vanity get between you and robustly serving an all-sufficient Christ. You know why? Because that's normal. That's normal on God's terms. He saved us to serve him. And we have the privilege of serving him. But the moment you find yourself unwilling, distasteful, the problem you're experiencing is at least discontentment. Not with this church. Not with this man. But with the Christ who purchased this church and sent you this man. And when you're discontented with Christ, nothing in his refrigerator will be appealing to you. Well, I'm telling you tonight, we ought to do this. We ought to get on our face in this place and begin to thank God for what he's done. I'm not telling you to beg him for anything. I'm telling you to pour out your heart in thanksgiving and do it until you, until you begin to experience real inward gratitude and compassion and love for God and the things he's done. To get on your life and go through the list. To get on your knees and, 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 and just look at all the things hard and easy that God's putting in your life. And the trials that you might be in the middle of and the, and the circumstances that could go either way. And just thank God for where you're at and who he's put in your life. And I mean just thank God and thank God and thank God. Because you'll never be contented until you begin to really thank God. You know, we have this habit of saying, I'll deal with all these things later. That's all so foolish. I don't mean to be mean. If you didn't deal with them before you came, what makes you think you're going to deal with them when you go home? That's what this altar's for. For us to get on our face and just begin tonight in true gratitude to thank God because an all-sufficient Christ is sufficient for all things. Do you understand, church? If we want revival, it's time to put leather on the knees and get on our face and begin to chase away discontentment, beginning at gratitude. Stand with me. I'm going to have a word of prayer with you. I'm going to invite you to come to this altar. I'm going to invite you to kneel where you're at if that's what you need to do. But I'm going to invite you to begin tonight on a journey towards gratitude. By appropriating this truth, not as a slogan, but as a life-changing truth. 
that the all-sufficient Christ is sufficient in all things. And then by getting down on your knees and the things that you found insufficient, begin to thank God for them until you recognize that they're his provision and gift in your life and that his sufficiency makes them sufficient and you rejoice and give God thanks for all that he's done and doing in your life. And you leave this place beginning to have a heart of contentment toward God. Heavenly Father, I pray you'd help us. I know, dear God, that we're tempted to, to shy away from these things. None of us wants to admit these things that we all know aren't present in our life. I wish that I'd stop that, and I wish that we'd stop that. And I wish that we'd be honest enough to admit when we're really not contented. And to begin by looking at what you've done and are doing in our life and give you thanks for who and what you've put in our life to praise God for them. Listen, I pray God for the struggling marriage tonight that the husband and the wife would get on their knees and thank God for their wife or thank God for their husband. Instead of looking at everything that they think they're not, that they would become thankful for who they are and what they are and for your provision of them in their life and that they would begin to be contented with you and with their spouse. God, help us to begin at gratitude and in this night at contentment with an all-sufficient Christ. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The piano is going to play. The altar is open to you. Would you get on your knees tonight? Would you begin?